to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. We're going to talk about a well-known story again. We're going to look a little deeper into it. And we're going to look at Gideon tonight. Um, you know, we begin in verses 1 through 5 there of Judges chapter 6, and, and we see the the devastation that was wrought upon the people because of the choices that they had made. In verse 1, it says, Then the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian seven years. You know, this is pretty much the narrative for the entire book of Judges, is it not? You know, I love because the the good times, the times of peace, the times where God's not punishing them for their choices to to serve idols, um, are usually summed up in like one verse. And they had 40 years of peace. And then it goes right back to, and they did what was right in their own eyes. And there was no king in the land. And they played harlot with, with uh, Baal. You know, w- whatever phrasing it would use, it would indicate unfaithfulness. But you know, the oppression of the Midianites pretty much drove the Israelites, this oppression that he's talking about here, pretty much drove the Israelites completely into hiding. You know, in verses 3 through 5, we see that the Midianites and the Amalekites came when the crops of Israel were ready to harvest. The oppression was less like, I always thought about, you know, an occupying army, occupying the cities coming in, you know, they're they're controlling the cities. That's really not what's going on here. uh, The Midianites are not occupying the cities of Israel. It's more on the lines of a raiding force. They, in other words, they come into the area and they just simply raid and take everything that they can get their hands on. They don't really care about occupying. They don't really care about controlling the land, so to speak. Their primary interest is simply to rob the land of everything that it has. You know, they would come up to Israel and set up a camp during the time of harvest and they would just sit there and raid the fields. You know, the Israelites have planted, they have tended to the crops, and, and right as they're ready to harvest them, here comes the Midianites and the Amalekites, and they take all the food. And that's what's happening. And that's what's been going on now for, for seven years, all your labor and all your toil and all your work, and it's getting stolen from you right when you're ready to harvest it. And not only that, but they're also taking the livestock that the Israelites have as well. Verse 5 adequately, I think very accurately, describes what's going on here. It says that they were like locusts. That sounds about like locusts, right? Just go across the land and leave nothing in your wake. That they were like locusts. They rode their camels and they moved quickly. And the land was devastated because of their actions. Let's consider the history for just a moment of of the Midianites and the Amalekites. The Midianites, they lived east of the Sinai Peninsula there on the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba. The nation descended, believe it or not, from Abraham. They came from Abraham through uh, Keturah, his son Midian, born to Keturah. Keturah was the wife that he had after Sarah died. Abraham married again and had a wife who had a number of sons, and one of those sons was Midian, and that's the father of the Midianite people. You know, Moses himself fled from Egypt when he had killed the Egyptian. He fled from Egypt into the land of of Midian and would live there and would would marry a Midianite woman named Zipporah. His father-in-law was a priest uh, of the Midianites. Midianites were a nomadic people. They didn't necessarily stop and plant their own crops. They didn't really do anything really to provide their own food. They were a nomadic people that raided, that raided other people, um, raided their crops, and that's what's happening in our text. The events with Gideon here, as we think about the Midianite people, you know, some some of the peoples that we have in the Old Testament, we kind of keep seeing them over and over and over, but really this story is going to pretty much bring the Midianites, uh, take them out of the picture, at least in regard to... Uh, the nation of Israel. The other group that's with them, and we, we don't often mention them as well, but they are with them. We, we always talk about the Midianites with Gideon, but there were also the Amalekites that were with them. They are descendants of Esau. 
they wandered the Sinai and the wilderness of southern Israel, as you can see on the map. Um, and we see them uh, in that very area uh, during the Exodus. While the Israelites are still very near to Mount Sinai, they are out there picking off the stragglers, so to speak, the, slow, the people that were a little bit slow, kind of drifting back back there by themselves. The Amalekites were coming in and raiding them, uh, not, not hitting the main body of the Israelite people, but these people that were kind of straggling. And, and that led to a battle that we talked about with Joshua a couple of weeks ago that Joshua led the battle against the Amalekites because of that. And that was the battle where Moses held up his staff. And based on where his staff was, that's how the battle uh, progressed, whether good or bad, for the Israelites. Well, God determined at that time that because of what the Amalekites did, because of the unprovoked nature of their attacks, that he said they were, that they were going to be a people that would be completely and totally annihilated. They were to be totally destroyed. And we can go forward in time, in fact, forward even from the time that we're talking about tonight, and we can see God tell King Saul, right? I want you to go to the Amalekites, and I want you to kill everything that breathes. Man, woman, child, animal. All of it. God says, I want you to annihilate them. And we know that Saul went on this mission, right, to do this, but... He didn't quite get it done, did he? Samuel come up and the people had taken the animals instead of killing them. King Agag was there. The king of, of the Amalekites was with them. And, and Samuel said, What is that I hear? <laughs> I hear sheep. Where did those come from? And Saul came up with his great excuse, right? Oh, we're going to offer those to God. We're going to sacrifice those. What was Samuel's response? Better to obey. Yeah. God rather you obey than to sacrifice. You know, that's what you need to be doing. And Samuel himself would hack Agag uh, to pieces, the Bible tells us. David would destroy much of the Amalekites during Saul's reign when him and his men were off fighting the Philistines and the Amalekites came to the city of Ziklag. And they took all of their families, all of David's men, all of their families. They took them away. And boy, when they came back, I mean... If you ever want to see a time of crisis in David's life, this was it. You know, he gets back with his army, his small army, and all their families are gone. And his men are ready to kill him. But they go and they get their families back and do great damage uh, to the Amalekites that day. There is a small remnant still mentioned in the time of King Hezekiah, but at that time that remnant was destroyed and the Amalekite people passed from history. In fact... There's very little, if any, archaeological evidence for the Amalekite people left uh, to this point. You know, it was the Amalekites when the children of Israel listened to the ten spies, or to the, um, yeah, the ten spies that said we can't go in. You know, and then God said, well, I'm not going to let you go in. They said, but we want to go in now. God said, no, you can't go now. But they went in anyway, right? And it was the Amalekites with the Canaanites that repulsed them and kicked them back out of the land and began their 40 years of wandering. They were just like the Midianites. They are a nomadic and warlike people. You know, the Israelites, when we read in verse 2 that they are in caves and in fortresses, you know, what, what we're probably seeing there in that brief verse is that the Israelites are trying to hide stuff. They're trying to hide their food. They're trying to hide their valuables. They're trying to hide the things that they don't want these nations to get. And so they're getting them into strongholds. But, you know, unless you're... One of the few cities that you'll ever see in, in ancient times that the crops were inside the cities would be Babylon. That, that's one of the few that I know of. And that's what made Babylon so strong is that you could surround Babylon they could still grow food. And they had the Euphrates River running through. So they still have water. There's nothing you could do to starve that city out. But they didn't have such cities. So if you ran to hide from the army of the Amalekites and the Midianites, you ran into the city and you left your crops outside the walls. And that's why they were so easy to, to go and to take uh, because Israelites were not able to stand up against them. Well, in verses 6 through 10, 
We see that after seven years of this type of oppression by these nomadic peoples, the Israelites called upon God. I know we immediately go, wow, that's good. I'm glad that they finally did that. They needed to do that, right? But did you catch that? Did did, did we miss something there? It took seven years for the people to look to God. I think there's an indication there of the hardness of these people's hearts. That you're willing to suffer for seven years rather than simply call to God for, for help. You know, the prophet of God, when they did call on God, the prophet of God said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, It was I who brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all your oppressors and dispossessed them before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. And you shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you live, but you have not obeyed me. God in this statement is reminding them of something. I delivered you. I put you in the land you're in. I drove the armies out ahead of you. Everything has been given to you by me. Everything you are, everything that you have is a result of what I have done. And it's not me that's walked away. Now, Gideon's going to talk about God abandoning them, but it's not God that's abandoned them. They've abandoned God. They've walked out of the house of God into a world where they're not protected anymore. And so, you know, God's reminding them, I have done these things for you. I didn't fail you. You have failed me. But you did not obey the things I said, even with all that I had done for you. In verses 11 through 24, we see that God calls Gideon while he is beating wheat in a wine press. You know, last week we talked about Ruth, right, and the threshing floor and the wheat there and processing that wheat. Well, Gideon's not at the threshing floor. Gideon is at a wine press and he's beating the wheat. He's not having an oxen walk around with the sled doing it as they normally did. Gideon, and what this shows is that Gideon probably doesn't have a whole lot to process. You know, he doesn't have a lot of wheat, so he's able to do it in a smaller area. And, you know, the wine press may very well be kind of in a hidden place. And he appears to be doing it by himself. And so maybe not trying to draw a crowd, right? Maybe not trying to be something that the Amalekites could see or the Midianites could see and come and and take whatever you have. And so we see some interesting aspects of what he's doing here as he's beating this wheat here in the process of of, of preparing it. You know, Gideon is a man that we see in this particular point who is suffering from the actions of the Amalekites. He's suffering from the actions of the Midianites, just like uh, all the other Israelites are doing as well. The Lord calls Gideon a a valiant warrior, uh, maybe to show what he's calling Gideon to be. Maybe Gideon, we don't really know, but maybe Gideon was a great warrior in some point in the past, and and God is making reference to what he already has been, but um, I think it's more on line of God's calling him to be a valiant warrior. Because what he's going to ask him to do as far as fighting is pretty impressive. And it's it's a lot to ask. Uh, In verse 13... Gideon basically tells the angel that God has has not been with the people. He goes, you're asking me to do this, but God's not with us. You haven't been with us. You've left us. He says, look around at what's happened to us and to the land. He states the Lord has abandoned us. That's how he feels. You know, you're, you're coming to me, but I have no reason to believe that God is in this land anymore. And so I think that gives us an idea of the level of distress that even a man that had a, you know, a character that would do as God says, that the level of distress that he's in. You can imagine what an ungodly person uh, thinks in regard to this. 
God ignores those statements. You know, they are true to an extent that God has abandoned the people to their sinful ways. And yet, that's exactly what we see in Romans chapter 1 too. also, right? That God talked about those that chose to not retain God in their knowledge any longer. They chose to worship the created rather than the creator who's blessed forever. And then he talks about the sins that come out of that kind of a choice. And he makes those statements where God turned them over to let them do those things which were impure. And that turned them over. God let them do it. God let them go. God let them go to the destruction that they chose to take themselves to. And God will. He will not violate the freedom of choice that he has given to us. He will let us make our choices and let us suffer the consequences for those choices. Like Moses, in this particular exchange with the angel of the Lord, Gideon makes excuses. Makes excuses for why he's not the best man for the job. And it is here at the very beginning that Gideon is is seen as... I don't think we should see Gideon yet as a, as a man of great faith. I mean, certainly we're going to see him in Hebrews 11.32 mentioned. But here early on, we're going to see that he has a little ways to go in finding the faith and the trust in God that is, is something that would be worthy of being mentioned with the people that are mentioned in Hebrews uh, chapter 11. He is going to require a lot of goading by God to get him to do what God wants him to ultimately do. Now, we have to say that he is a man willing to obey God, but there is a degree to which he is not trusting God on the level that he's going to need to. He needs, you know, he, he struggles unless he's given some kind of assurance. He struggles to stay with God. His excuse was that he was from a family that is low on the social scale. Not only is he from a family that's low on the social scale in the tribe of Manasseh, but he is the youngest son. So he's the lowest person on the family rung too, right? Uh, so, you know, he says, I'm, I'm in a low family and I'm in a low position in the low family. So uh, he just says, I don't really know why you want me. But God reassures him that he will be with him. And, and then I, I love what God says, and you will defeat Midian, or Midian as one man. Now, that's, that's a powerful statement. I'll tell you what that reminds me of. 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 6. The Philistines are sitting on one hill and Saul and his army are sitting on the other hill. Saul and his army, they're too scared to come off their hill. But Jonathan gets up one day and he's had enough. Saul's son. And Jonathan tells his sword bearer, hey, son, I'm going over there. And his sword bearer, great guy, he says, I'm right there with you. You look to the right, there I am. You look to the left, there I am. I'm right there beside you. And, they, and he says, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to call up to them. If they tell me to come up, that means that God's given them into my hand. Two men against the Philistine army. And listen to what, what he says, verse 6 of 1 Samuel 14. Then Jonathan said to the young man who was carrying his armor, Come and let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps the Lord will work for us. For the Lord is not restrained to save by few or by many. Now, you know what he's saying there? The numbers of people involved are irrelevant to God. If he wants to win the battle with one person, one person will win the battle. If God wants to take 10,000 people into battle, they're still going to win the battle. It doesn't matter what they're facing. And that, that's what Jonathan was saying. There may be only two of us, but God can win with two just as easy as he can win with 100,000. Because the trifling battles that we have on this earth are mere nothing to God in regard to his omnipotent power. God's statement to him was not enough. Gideon wanted a, a sign. You know, Jesus kind of wore tired, didn't he? Of the Jews asking him for a sign. I mean, how many miracles you got to work? Right? I mean, he'd get done doing a miracle, and then he'd say something, they'd go, where's the sign for that? Well, I just did a miracle. 
And there's times where he just said, that's not going to give you one. Paul talked about the Jews, that, they're stumbling, that they were you know, always wanting a sign given, uh, even in, 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 you know, as we go forward in, in the Lord's church. So Gideon goes and he prepares an offering and presents it to the angel of the Lord. And the angel told him to put the meat and the unleavened bread on a rock and to pour the broth that he had made on top of that. Very similar to Elijah. Remember that sacrifice he made on Mount Carmel? He built the altar, he dug a pit around it, and he, he put the sacrifice on top of it, and then he just drenched it, didn't he? He just poured water upon water on it. So that it was just as drenched and soaked and full of standing water around it as it could be. So that when the fire of the Lord came and totally consumed the whole thing, that was impressive. Here they put it on a rock, soaked the food that's on it, and the angel touches the rock with its staff. And when it does, the sacrifice is consumed by fire from the rock. And at that moment, when that happened, it says that the angel of the Lord disappeared. So Gideon built an altar on that spot where he had spoken to God. A lesson I want us to take from this point of, the, of, of what we're looking at is that God sees what we can be, even if we don't quite see it, even if we're not quite there. God knows my potential. He knows your potential better than we know ourselves, and he knows better than we know or, or even think in regard to ourselves. And, but even though God knows our potential and he knows what we can be, there's still something I have to do, right? There's still something I have to put into this effort for God to bless. We still have to live up to that potential through our obedience to God. Gideon had potential, certainly better than a lot of the other people in the land, and he had potential. Even though we, we see some flaws here, we see a potential in him that's going to land him in the, in the chapter about faith. But yet, faith with anybody whether it's you, me, or Gideon, even Abraham. It's a process of growth. We don't walk out one day and have this great and powerful faith. Faith is built every day. We get stronger every day. Our trust in God builds every day. And it's a growth process. And we need to, we need to do all that we can to live up to the potential that I'm sure God sees in us. And we do that in how we live Verses 25 to 32, that very night after these events take place, God comes to, to Gideon in a dream and he tells him that he wants him to go and tear down his father's altar to Baal and the Asherah. Um, Baal, or Baal, however you want to pronounce it, I always find it easier to say Baal, um, was a Phoenician and Canaanite god for rain, storm, fertility, and anything else the Canaanites decided to assign to him, he's kind of got, he kind of picked up a lot. The word Baal literally means Lord or Master. So sometimes it's used in regard to a number of pagan gods, that this pagan god's your Lord or your Master, it's your Baal, right? It's not the same god every time we see it mentioned uh, in the Old Testament. Um, we see examples where... The Old Testament even adds a, 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 a hyphen to it and puts another word out there like Bel Gad or Bel Peor to specify that they were talking about the pagan lord or master over a particular group of people in a particular location. The Asherah was one of the Canaanite goddesses of love, sex, and war often associated with Baal as his wife or his sister or his lover. Um, worship, uh, in regard to the Asherah, was basically sexual immorality of all kinds. And uh, that's uh, what was seen as the worship. And certainly that is what would have made it attractive to some. The Asherah would be a wooden post 
Or it might be a grove of trees. We see it in various ways in the Old Testament, but they would make this wooden post where these acts, these immoral acts would take place, or they'd make a grove of trees, and the people would go into the grove of trees and, and, and do these things that they would call worship to this pagan goddess. Well, God tells him, I want you to go tear down your father's altar to Baal and this Asherah. And, you know, Gideon... The Bible makes it very clear to us that he's afraid. He's afraid of his father's men, and he's afraid of the men of the city. Now, here, here's, where it, here's where I'm telling you. that There's obedience here, but there's still some trust issues uh, with, with what God can do for him. I mean, it's not like, you know, yeah, like David when he went out to face Goliath. Yeah, I can whoop him. You know, there just wasn't any fear in David. But Gideon has that, but he still does what God says. He takes 10 men, he goes in the middle of the night. <laughs> you know, I'll do it when nobody's looking. <laughs> I don't want to have to fight him while I do it. Um, and he, he, pulls, he pulls down uh, that, that altar and uh, destroys that Asherah there in the middle of the night. And then he took the wood from that Asherah and he offered a sacrifice to God using that wood. Well, really this action that God has... Gideon do here, it's symbolic for the people of that time. The people needed to remove the bells in their life, the idols in their life, so that they could get God's blessings. And so, you know, it's a message to the people. And, you know, when I talk about him trusting God here, okay, so you got his father's household and you got a few men in this small little town here in the valley of Jezreel. Uh, that he's afraid of, and yet God is about to tell him, I want you to go and attack 135,000 armed men. <laughs> he's got a little ways to go in the old trust department, doesn't he? If he's afraid of his father's household and the few men in the city, and yet God's fixing to send him up against an enormous army of hardened soldiers. You know, when you look at this and you, you see how he is in this regard, being afraid at this point, you kind of begin to go, maybe God isn't making the best choice here, right? I think you need a little more of a man like David or like Joshua and Caleb. Um, Gideon's not quite there yet. But I think the lesson that we take from that is that God expects each of us he expects each of us to clear the idols from our life, whatever those may be. We don't, we don't worship little images anymore, but we sure do worship dollar bills, and we sure do worship possessions, and we sure do worship acclaim, and we sure do worship a lot of things in our lives. When they, we put them first before God, they are as much an idol as a little stone image that these people bow down to. And God wants them torn down. He wants them removed. That's the first thing that Gideon needed to do was get the idols out. And you look at Matthew chapter 7, and Jesus is talking about, uh, we kind of get stuck on the judging part of it, but really this process is here at the beginning of, of that chapter in Matthew 7 where Jesus talks about taking the beam out of your own eye, right? Never miss the fact that Jesus never says that it's not our job to get the speck out of our brother's eye. He said before we get the speck out of our brother's eye, let's get the beam out of ours because that's going to enable me to do it better. To be able to see, as Jesus said, more clearly. And so, you know, basically what that is, we would say in Mississippi, you go sweep your own porch before you start coming over and telling me how dirty my porch is. And uh, so, you know, we need to do that. We need to fix our lives. And, and that's what Gideon is in the process of doing here as he tears down uh, these idols. Well, the men of the city are upset. They're upset at Gideon's destruction of the altar to Baal and the Asherah, and they want to kill him the next day. And I find something very interesting in this story at this particular point because it is Gideon's father that stands up for Gideon and says that, it is ba that if Baal is a god, let Baal take care of him. If Baal is a god, let Baal fight his battles. In fact, that's going to change Gideon's name to Jerubal, which says Baal... <laughs> needs to do his own fighting, right? But that's interesting. Why would this father now stand up against Baal when he had obviously financed building the altar in the Asherah to begin with? Tear down your father's altar and your father's Asherah. 
What's happened with this man? Well, I think there's a few things that are possible. Maybe he went along with the people, no real belief in Baal anyway, but scared of the people. We see that, don't we, in the Bible? There were a lot of people who believed in Jesus, but the Bible then turns around and says, but they were afraid, and so they kind of stayed where they were. Maybe he did that, maybe to maintain his position in the town. Maybe, you know, to maintain his place in whatever the, the order was, the governing order was in, in the city. We even see this just a little bit, do we not? A, a little microcosm of this with Aaron. What did Aaron tell Moses happened that day the golden calf came about? People made me do it, but then he's had another little story to follow it up. Yeah, that... I just wonder, you know, how, how, how do you really think you're going to get away with that, Aaron? We threw the gold in the fire and out hopped this golden calf. That no more happened than anything. Aaron just got a little messed up in his thinking that day. He's down there alone with two million people wanting to build a calf, and he went along with it, um, even though he is certainly a, a man of God. Maybe this father, maybe he was inspired by his son's faith and courage. And there's certainly something to be said about that. Maybe he realized as he saw this that Baal did nothing. Maybe he realized how hollow all the idols are. No power. And that's, that, that, that goes along with his, his statement. And isn't that what Elijah proved on Mount Carmel? Remember, they're calling, Oh, Baal, oh, Baal, oh, Baal. They're calling for him. And he was God of rain, by the way, and it hadn't rained. But <laughs> maybe he's asleep. You know, that's what, that, that was Elijah's point. Why isn't he answering? What, why isn't he doing anything? And then God does something. And, and it makes a clear distinction. I think a lesson we draw here is that it is easy to just go along with the world and sometimes even easy to go along with the things that oppose God. I'm not talking about necessarily committing them, but just going along with them. You don't have to commit them, just approve of them or just even ignore them. Romans 1 talks about that it's not just those that commit those things, but those that give their approval to those things as well. Jesus stated that a person is either for with him or against him in Luke chapter 11 and verse 23, and apathy or ignoring wrong will never qualify as being with Jesus. And so if that is the case with this father, we can't just go along because we'll be just as guilty. Yeah, I, actually, I forgot to put that one on the end. Thank you. Um, and there's always the, the one other option on, on this is that they're trying to kill his son, right? Now, that changes people in a lot of ways. So, yes, I think that's a very plausible one as well. I thought I had that down, but I completely forgot about it. Thank you, Jerry. In verses 33 through 35, we see that uh, the Midianites and the Amalekites assemble on the east side of the Jordan River, and then they cross over and camped in the valley of Jezreel. And the valley of Jezreel is that long stretch of valley. A few valleys uh, going off of it, but it, it's the main area right there through the middle of, of Israel between the Galilee area and the Judean hill country. You know, the valley of Jezreel, it is the breadbasket uh, of Israel. You can see in this picture of the, of the valley today that it is a flat, long expanse of, of fertile land uh, many Old Testament stories take place in this area, especially stories involving the, uh, the northern kingdom of the divided kingdom times. It is in the valley of Jezreel, off there in the distance between those two hills there that you see in the distance, um, where Saul's sons die in that final battle. That hill on the right, Mount Geboa, is where Saul himself would die. Naboth's vineyards out there, when Ahab, or Jezebel rather, killed him for the vineyard. That picture looks like it's being taken just above the city of Nain, which you see right there in the bottom right corner. A little bit back behind that is Megiddo, uh, which we know better by the way people have changed it to Armageddon today. Uh, Mount Carmel is behind this picture and back to the left. You remember when Elijah left Mount Carmel, he, he outran the chariots. Remember that? He... Uh, rain was coming, and he took off running, and he beat them there, um, running across the, the Jezreel Valley to the city of Jezreel. Well, the Midianites and the Amalekites have 135,000 men 
in that valley harvesting uh, the grain. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and had his, uh, he called together his tribe of Manasseh. They also called for Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali to come. Those are the, the tribes uh, in the immediate area. And then in verses 36 through 40, we see again a little bit of the weakness of Gideon's faith. We see a weakness in his trust in God. He actually asked God for another sign. Yeah, <laughs> you, just, you just keep asking. And God does it. He says... I, I'm going to, I'm at, the, he's at the threshing floor. He said, I'm going to put a piece of fleece down, this material. I'm going to put it down on the ground and, and, and overnight I want you to put dew on the fleece, but not on the ground around it. And, and we're at the threshing floor, right? So this is an area that's supposed to be dry. So that you can sift the wheat. You can't sift the wet, wet wheat. Um, And so this is a very dry area. It's going to be very easy to tell whether it's got moisture in it or not come the next morning. So the next morning comes and and he picks up the the piece of fabric that was on the ground and it's soaked and the ground is completely bone dry around it. And it says that he squeezes out the flax and, and it, or the fleece rather, and it fills an entire bowl full of water. We're not talking about damp here. We're talking about soaking wet. Ah, that'd be enough for me. I don't know about y'all. But he actually goes, well, I got another test for you, God. <laughs> don't be angry. I mean, he understands he's pushing it, right? Like Abraham said, you know, just one more time. He knows he's pushing it, and he says, okay, let's switch it. I put the fleece down, let it be dry, and the ground wet. And that's exactly what happens uh, the next day. You know... It's a dangerous thing to test God. Isn't that what Jesus said when the devil wanted him to jump off the temple because it said that the angels would come and keep him from hitting the ground? And, and, and yet, there's no reason to believe that's not exactly what would happen, but Jesus isn't going to jump off just to test God. Jesus knows God would do exactly what he says he'll do. He doesn't have to test him to decide whether God's trustworthy or not. He says, don't test the Lord your God. And so, you know, it's not it's kind of a dangerous thing that, that Gideon's kind of doing here. And the lesson we draw from that is God is patient with us, and thankfully so, even when we're testing him. But that patience will not be forever. There is an end to it. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, Gideon assembles an army about six miles from the Midianites. There are 32,000 men that comes together you know, even at that kind of number, and we think that's a pretty good sized army, but even at that number, it's still going to take quite a bit of faith to go up against 135,000, isn't it? I mean, it's not exactly like he's got a great huge army. Uh, he's got that proverbial military desire of three to one. He doesn't have that for an attacking army. In fact, he's, he's outnumbered at this point four to one in, in an army that is already in place. So he asked the question. God said, that's too many. Don't you, don't you know as a general? He's going, what? <laughs> Does a general ever have too many men? I, I don't think any general goes, i got too many. Takes takes my men away. Um, he goes, you got too many men. And so he goes out there and he goes, who's afraid? Who's trembling? <laughs> he said, if you're afraid or trembling, you're going home. And 22,000 men walk away. So now you're down to 10,000 against 135,000. That's still long odds. And God says, you got too many. Have them go down there and drink out of the, out of the, out of the springs. And if they go down there and they, they get the water in their hand, they bring it up to their mouth, those are the ones you keep. But if they go down there and they just get on their hands and knees and they put their you know, tongue down in the water like a cow or some animal does and lick the water straight into their mouth he says you let them go home that brings us all the way down to 300 we know we know that number well well it took all day to bring that number from 32,000 down to 300 
and now they're fixing to fight all night because the battle's going to happen almost immediately. Like Jericho, when you take it down to that kind of number, God is making it clear to you that it's him that's going to give you the victory. You're not going to walk away from this and go, boy, it was our great military savvy that got that done. There's no military savvy that 300 people stop 100, you know, defeat 132,000. In verses 9 through 14, God tells Gideon, go down and attack the Midianites. And I love God here because God just decides to get out ahead of it. Get out ahead of, of, of uh, Gideon's doubts. Get out ahead of Dick Gideon's fears, his lack of his failure in trusting. He says, and if you're afraid... <laughs> God just goes ahead and just gives him something. He goes, and if you're afraid, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your servant, and I want you to go down to the camp of the Midianites. Get close. I want you to listen. I want you to listen to what they're talking about there in the camp, and then you'll be all right. You know, I guess we would have been impressed had Gideon went, that's not necessary. But he didn't. He took his little servant, and he went down because, well, he was afraid. Verse 12 tells us that they were numerous as locusts, camels without number, and they were like the sands of the seashore across the valley. But in verses 13 through 14, this is what it says. When Gideon came, behold, a man was relating a dream. Now this is a man over in the Midianite camp, relating a dream to his friend. And he said, Behold, I I had a dream. A, A loaf of barley bread was tumbling into the camp of Midian, and it came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so the tent lay flat. And his friend replied, Well, this is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given Midian and all the camp into his hand. I'd, if I was that guard, I'd be a little afraid, if that's really what you think is the case. Um, but this dream, you know, of course, this began with him beating wheat, right? And here's a barley bread coming down the hill. Uh, you know, this is Gideon. I mean, they certainly know that there's an, a group of men gathering. Well, Gideon heard the dream, and he worshipped God as a result of it. I think we see his faith building as, as we see that, 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 that take place. The plan is that they break up into three groups. Obviously, we have a hundred each. Each man had a trumpet and, an empty, and empty pitchers with torches inside. And all the men were to cue themselves off Gideon's action. In other words, he's going to do what he does, and then you do what he does in, in, in following that. So all the men did that, and they attacked in the middle of the night. They have the camp surrounded, as much as 300 men can. They broke the pitchers and blew the trumpets and shouted, A Lord, um, a sword of the Lord and for Gideon. And the Midianites fought each other in the dark. Folks, it's not like today. They didn't have uniforms. I mean, they were just out there in their clothes, whatever clothes they wore. They, they didn't have uniforms in these days and times. So in the dark, everybody kind of looks like the same person. Uh, you know, same group. You could be in amongst them, and they, they wouldn't necessarily know whether you're a friend or foe. And, and in this disorientation of men waking up in the middle of the night, they just begin to fight and kill each other. I remember when Miranda was young, and she was premature, and, and when we brought her home, she was on this, this heart monitor. And that thing would set off if her heart stopped. And I remember one night, it, her heart didn't stop, but she pulled one of the leads off, and that thing went off, and I nearly tore a hole through the wall. Because I came out of the bed so fast, I went through furniture, I went through chairs, the door was shut, I hit it. I mean, you know, I just, it just, I was just so disoriented that there was no cognitive uh, thought as to where everything was. I just was trying to tear my way into the other room. And, and uh, so I think that's kind of what we see here. You know, you kind of get woke up in a, in a rush, and you're disoriented, and you're kind of just doing whatever... Uh, you're swinging your sword, I guess, in this particular case, wherever. Also says the Lord caused this, so you know the Lord had His hand in on the confusion as well, uh, aside from just natural confusion of when you wake up suddenly. Um, well, they rout them, they pursue the enemy, and we see uh, their their pursuit route there, and they they caught they summon the other tribes to come in to help in the pursuit. They ask Ephraim to come down and to take all the river crossings on the River Jordan. And Ephraim does that, and as a result of that, they capture two of the leaders of the Midianites and and do a lot of damage to the army that's trying now to escape back the way that it came. But the Ephraimites are upset. They're like, hey, why weren't we included in this when this all started? You know, they're thinking about loot. And uh, 
Gideon's a sly guy. He plays to their vanity. He goes, well, he said, y'all are so great. There's nothing we could do ever compared to the Ephraimites. You know, that's basically what he tells them. And, they, and he goes, well, then they were a little bit happier. You know, <laughs> you know just the size of his ego is just a little bit. Uh, and the Ephraimites are better. Well, they come to, if you look on down here at the bottom of the map, so they've gone a long way to two cities, Sukkoth and Penuel. And they come to those cities, and they ask both of those cities for supplies. These are Israelite cities. We're pursuing them. We've been pursuing them all night. We need some bread. We need some water. We need some supplies. And here's what both cities said. Have you captured their two kings yet? No, I don't think so. Because what they're thinking is, if you don't capture their two kings, they're going to come back and punish us for helping you, right? Well, he tells Sukkoth, he says, when I come back, I'm going to take your men and I'm going to whip them with thorn bushes. And then he tells Penuel, he says, I'm going to come back and tear down your tower and punish you for what you've done when I've captured those kings. So Gideon pursues the kings and the last of the 15,000 men that were left. So at this point, folks, 120,000 men have fallen in battle. And there's 15,000 left, and he jumps on them in their camp, surprises them, kills them, and ends up capturing the kings. Well, he comes back and does exactly what he says. He comes to Sukkoth, finds a young man. This young man, I don't know out of fear or out of uh, loyalty to Gideon, I don't know which, but he gives him 77 names of the leaders, and Gideon finds them and whips them. He goes to Penuel, and he tears down their tower, and he kills their men. And he tried the kings, and they admitted to uh, killing the men at Mount Tabor, which is there in the Jezreel Valley as well. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because <laughs> the kings were... He told his son to kill them, and his son was young, and he was timid, and, and, he, and he kind of hesitated. And, and the kings seemed to say to Gideon, why don't you do it yourself? <laughs> well, Gideon doesn't have a problem with that. And Gideon does. And he kills the two kings of the Midianites. Well, one quick thing in the class will be yours. Verses 22 through 37. They try to make Gideon king. Oh, they just want a king so bad like the nations around them, don't they? Gideon says no, but I want you to listen to what Gideon says because this goes with what we talked about last week about there being no king in the land. He says to them... No, the Lord will rule over you. There's the king. That's, the, that's why we see that phrase so many times. And then you get, that, you get that single verse, everything was good for 40 years, and that's it. Okay, we got that, that, that comprises all the good. And then this is what it says in verses 33 through 35 to bring us full circle. Then it came about as soon as Gideon was dead that the sons of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal bereft their God. Thus the sons of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the house of Jerubbabel, which is Gideon, in accord with all the good that he had done to Israel. They never learn. They never learn. And they turn right back and go away from God. How many times does God bless us? And we're so thankful when we get those blessings and then we forget about Him. Uh, we may we never be those people. God gives victory by His power, but He still requires our faith, our trust, our thankfulness, and our devotion to Him and Him alone. As a result of all that He's done, He expects our obedience. Let's end our class now with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've had. We thank you for the study of your word and for the, these stories that you have given to us from, in the Old Testament for us to look and to see your interaction with man and what you expect of us, these great examples of, of people that live faithful and people that did not. And Father, we pray that we are always those people that live faithful to you, those people that always understand that we have a king and you are our king, and we'll always be that. Father, we pray that you go with us now, and that you strengthen us, and that you bless us as you always have. And bring us back uh, the next time we come together as your family. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.